Hello there and welcome to video number six of Evolution 201. This is our final video in which we're going to be looking at the origin of species. Now that title is a nod to Charles Darwin because speciation, the formation of new species, is one of the key things that Darwin focused on early on when developing the theory of evolution. And the quote on this slide shows that he grappled with the idea of what a species is and how the, the species formed. And this occurred for much of his career. So Charles Darwin said, firstly, why? If species have descended from other species by insensibly fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? Why is not all nature in confusion instead of the species being, as we see them, well-defined? And that's a really key and interesting question. So it's one that has been uh, studied ever since. As I have highlighted um, just now, the process of speciation is essentially the origination of new species. And this usually occurs from a single ancestral population. I've put a definition saying that on this slide here. Speciation is important to study because it's the origin of the kind of biodiversity that we see in the world today. It's how that biodiversity came, um, came to be. And the biodiversity that we see, the level of biodiversity, is dictated by the balance between speciation and the balance uh, and uh, extinction, which we learn about in another series of videos. So actually, those two are balancing each other out, and where that equilibrium lies defines the biodiversity of the globe. So it's a really key topic. So when we're thinking of species formation, well, we're typically going to be going with the biological species concept because this operates on about the right timescales for us to study the processes by which species form. If we're going to use that as our, our, our basis for understanding speciation, we then need to consider reproductive isolation because that's part and parcel of the biological species concept as we learned in the last video. So then our key question about the origin of species is how does reproductive isolation arise? So that is often, but not always, as we will see, driven by geographic isolation. So you have geographic isolation that then is followed by reproductive isolation. So two populations stop interbreeding. That can occur through the introduction of a barrier or another form of separation um, forming a geographic split between um, populations. In the biogeography videos, we learned about barriers. And you can see this playing out in this little diagram on the left-hand side here. You have an original population. You then have a barrier forming. That could be a continental rift. It could be a mountain chain. It could be an ocean. It could be any one of the barriers that we've learned about in those videos. And then over time, these two populations will diverge. And eventually, because they are isolated and there's no gene flow between them because they can't cross this barrier, they form um, reproductively isolated clusters or populations. And even if you then take away that barrier, um, they are still reproductively isolated for each other. So they've still formed um, separate species. I guess the lion and the tiger was a very good example of um, closely related but reproductively isolated organisms. Though how they speciated is, a, is a, a question for another day, I suspect. When the introduction of a barrier or another form of separation um, uh, creates speciation, we call this allopatric speciation. I've put a definition of, uh, of allopatric speciation on the slide for you here. This is the formation of new species from the ancestral one as a result of the geographic separation or fragmentation of the breeding population. Some examples are shown in the middle here. On the left and the right are sister species, closely related species, that have been isolated by the Isthmus of Panama and the development thereof. And so even though they're closely related, to each other now, they are reproductively isolated from each other. If you put a load of these over the other side of the Isthmus of Panama, they would no longer be able to interbreed, therefore they're different species. On the right hand side, you can see that example we used from um, paleobiogeography of vicarians. If you don't know what that is, you can watch those videos, but um, just be aware, aware that this is kind of like, um, this is just the same thing, but on a very big scale where you've had these flightless birds living on different continents. They originally had a single shared ancestor when all of the globe was one continent, 
the, pay the continents have split apart and different lineages have evolved to be different species on each continent that they're living on. So that was something that we called vicariants. There are a few ways we can think about speciation where we can, um, we can identify that these uh, are related to geography, but they don't necessarily involve barriers. One example of this is peripatric speciation. So the, the definition I've put on the slide here is that is a form of allopatric speciation in which the founder population becomes established beyond the existing range of the main population. It then remains isolated because of difficult terrain or other factors. Such a founder population may involve just a few individuals or even a single fertilized female, and so has much smaller gene pool compared to the main population. So the, the, the thing that's worth noting here is the key difference is that this isn't due to a barrier, this is due to dispersal. Because we're also talking about a small group at the periphery of another one, hence the word peripatric, there is a, a strong founder effect. So in a previous video where we saw with small populations, you can have lots of changes due to drift in, um, uh, in the genetics of a small population. That's the thing that's called the founder effect. And in this case, it allows genetic drift, so random changes, um, to be a fairly integral um, uh, thing to consider in this form of speciation. It's been suggested in the past that this is an important way by which new species arrive at the periphery of species ranges using examples drawn from island populations of birds. Uh, uh, an example from New Guinea is shown on the right hand side here. Um, but it's generally thought that this is a relatively rare form of speciation. So let's move onwards. And let's talk about parapatric speciation. This is speciation in which there is free exchange of genes between two populations of living organisms, which are directly adjacent, but in environmentally different habitats. Um, so here is a situation where, as you can see, we have um, neighbouring populations that diverge while they continue to interbreed. So there is still gene flow going between these different populations. Nevertheless, their phenotypes may differ slightly between the populations that are interbreeding. And you can see this developing here. This example is when one um, population enters a new niche and evolves in the adjacent niche to ultimately form um, a reproductively isolated, i.e. separate species. On the right hand side is an example of this kind of um, speciation in action. So this is an example of lizards which are found in the White Sands region of New Mexico. Here you have dunes, shown at the top, which are a very light coloured sand that formed less than 5,000 years ago. And they differ starkly from the surrounding dark soils. And what we see is two separate species of lizards shown here, um, in our rows, I guess, um, which are responding in a very similar way um, to this change in environment. So species of li lizards that are distributed across both of these environments, the white sands and the dark soils, are showing very different populations inhabiting the soils from those inhabiting the dunes. And the differences that we see in both of these species include head shape, toe length and colour. And we also see, if we look at the genetics, that there are strong differences in the frequencies of genetic markers across the boundary between the habitats. So in these graphs, each bar is one individual from one of these either white sand or dark soil populations. Green shows the probability, based on their genotype, that an individual belongs to the white sand population. So you get lots more green in both lizards here and a lot less green in both lizards in dark soil. And you can see that this process is um, further along in this species here than it is in that species there. So here we've got two species with genes flowing between different populations. The fact that these aren't all green or all blue shows us that, but they are differentiating. This is parapatric speciation in action. I want to finally introduce sympatric speciation. This is the evolution of reproductive isolation within an initially randomly mating population. It's the most extreme instance of speciation with gene flow and is thought to require very, very strong selection. So here you can see in these series of steps in this diagram on the left hand side here that you, orig you start um, the initial steps of speciation actually within a population through, a, say, a genetic polymorphism. And then that 
reproductive isolation evolves within the population. Because it requires such strong selection, this is a bit more controversial than the others, uh, other mechanisms of speciation I've shown you thus far as a result. And we're not clear how often this happens, but we do know it does happen. We do see examples, and there's a couple that I've put here. One of these is in Cichelid fish in Nicaragua. There are a small number of crater lakes I'm in between two of the Great Lakes here, that are marked on this map, that have been colonised by these fish from the Great Lakes on either side. Citrullids within each crater lake, lake are genetically more similar to each other than they are to any other population, so each one of these individual lakes has its own species. But within each of those lakes we see divergence into different um, colour morphs that represent different ecological niches. So these individuals are sharing a lake, so they're geographically completely overlapping, but they've differentiated into colour morphs, we think based on ecological niche. So that's really, really interesting. And we see this in the fossil record as well. Um, we have the forearm example I used to demonstrate the difference between anagenesis and cladogenesis um, here on the right. And I'm going to dig into that a tiny bit deeper for the end of this video. But I just wanted to highlight and sum up that before that, that if two populations are living in the same or adjacent areas, um, so um, under these there is still gene flow, there are mechanisms by which they can become isolated, and these are quite varied. We can split those, if we want to, into ecological isolation, where potential mates don't meet, or um, other forms of isolation where they do meet. So in terms of ecological isolation, we could have um, species that have, um, or populations that are isolated through temporal isolation. So for example, they may breed at different times of day or in different seasons, such as the, the uh, storm petrel. It has very seasonal breeding, this bird that's shown on the left-hand side here. And we've already met the example of cicadas when we were talking about niches, which have uh, a strong temporal isolation that helps in their niche differentiation. That could similarly um, be the basis of, um, say, a speciation, if we wanted to consider it in this framework. Or we could talk about habitat isolation, where species mate and breed in different habitats. So, for example, um, these ladybirds here, closely related species of ladybird, feed and mate on different species of plants. So even though they share the same area, there is a, there is a habitat isolation there. And that both of those um, forms of ecological isolation means that our potential mates don't meet. If we have our mates meeting, we can still expect some form of isolation either through their behaviour or through other mechanisms. So in terms of behavioural isolation, we, this is, we can consider when potential mates meet, but they do not mate. So that could be due to sexual isolation, individuals um, may prefer mating with members of their own species. So, for example, moths, shown on this image here, um, have species um, which use female sex pheromones as part of their reproductive um, cycle. And this may prevent breeding between species based on the response of males to those pheromones. Or through pollinator isolation, this may occur where pollinators do not transfer pollen between species of plants. If mates meet, and they mate, it could be that um, zygotes do not form. So this could be as a result of, say, mechanical isolation. The reproductive um, structures of the sexes may not fit very well, either preventing um, mating or making it not very successful. An example here is the genital arch of the male Drosophila um, fly, which is involved in transferring sperm, and the shape differs among closely related species very, very um, quickly. Uh, so um, it kind of it looks like, or I, sh I shouldn't say quickly, that implies a rate, but the, the structure differs and there's a key way by which these species may differentiate from each other. There may be some form of copulatory isolation where the female is not stimulated by males of the other species. Or there may be some form of gametic isolation. This is a failure of fertilization of the gametes when these um, meeting these species do, um, or these populations do mate with each other. And of course, if um, differing populations um, do mate, we may expect the hybrids to be less fit.
So there are a series of mechanisms there by which we may expect reproductive isolation to develop in sympatric speciation, but also in parapatric speciation. Um, so bear that, uh, and parapatric speciation as well, I should say. And of course, these mechanisms could be occurring even in allopatric speciation across that barrier. So those are the mechanisms by which reproductive isolation occurs. Let's finish this example by looking at this great example that I've already introduced of speciation from the fossil record showing a deep time perspective. And I think this is a really lovely example because it uses microfossils. Because of that, we have lots of samples. These have been recovered via ocean drilling, meaning we can give different layers of sediment to give us the aspects of time. Essentially, in terms of numbers of individuals and in terms of their time separation, through a drill core, the sampling of this event that I'm going to unpack for you is really excellent. The authors of this study, um, which uh, were uh, Pearson and Izard, um, study the organism that's shown in this diagram here. This is a foram, so I mentioned it previously, but this is a form of amoeba, a single-celled eukaryote. So it has a nucleus in its cell, but it isn't multicellular. And these cells make a shell called the test. What the authors of this study have done is they've got 10,200 individuals of this organism from 51 stratigraphically ordered samples from the tropical North Pacific from our drill cores. And these give us insights into the evolution of this population of this species at 175,000 year time intervals between 45 and 34 million years ago. That is a very large sample number. It's the kind of sample number most paleontologists can only dream of. And the authors make use of that large sample number um, by taking 10 measurements on each one of these tests, these shells, which you can see on the left-hand side here. Measurements such as those have allowed them to do univariate statistics. So univariate statistics are statistics devoted to analysing the effects of one or more independent variables on a single dependent variable. Um, so in this case, this is looking at chamber variation, the distribution thereof within a single um, sample uh, of, uh, within a single uh, time sample. When you do this sort of analysis, and then you start to look at these individual graphs showing these distributions through time, through different sedimentary layers, you can start to build up a picture uh, and quantify the evolution of the group. And that's what this video shows here. You can see just three of these measurements um, from different samples, and every time this fades in and out, what we're seeing is that we're going from a from one sample to a different sample. And in this three-dimensional space, we see everything starting off clustered towards the middle of this graph. As we go through the samples, then suddenly in this um, uh, graph here, you can see that they're split into two separate clusters based on these three measurements that these authors have taken across the different layers of rock. So what that split shows us from um, being one single cluster to two that are now being coloured in red and in black is that um, speciation has occurred. That's really interesting. That's great. But also you may be looking at that being like, mm, not sure about that. Um, you know, how do we know that these are definitely two clusters rather than one long smooshed out cluster? Well, again, we can use statistics. So... If we suggest that what we're seeing is a speciation event, we can actually do a quantitative definition of that because a speciation event we can um, says we're going from one cluster of individuals based on all of the measurements that we're taking to two clusters of individuals based on those um, measurements that we're taking. If we're doing this, we'll have to undertake something that's called multivariate statistics. This is the branch of statistics that's devoted to investigating the influence of one or more independent variables acting on more than one dependent variable. There are lots of ways we can do this, but what you can see on these graphs on the right hand side here is a thing called principal components analysis. This is um, a way that we can take um, observations of lots of different measurements and essentially we can smoosh them onto a single two-dimensional diagram. It's a form of dimensional reduction. And what it means is that, say, on 
this axis here that goes from left to right, you've got the maximum amount of variation that you see in across all of the many dimensions of your data set. On the y-axis here, you've got um, a kind of a, a spread that is orthogonal or 90 degrees to that. So basically think of this as a way of taking uh, 30, oh, sorry, however many measurements we had, 10 dimensions and smooshing that down onto two and then putting that into a graph that you can see. Within that um, PCA plot, the principal component analysis plot, you can then do cluster recognition. You can say, quantitatively, I want to identify different clusters. And when we do that, or when the authors do that, with their data on the left-hand side here, you can see that they were able to, at the beginning, automatically identify a single cluster of our four rams. But then, after 37 million years ago, when they take this automated approach, um, they actually start to delineate two clusters of individuals. And that is our spe two species that are for have formed. This is speciation happening in action. So this is quite cool. It's an objective way of identifying speciation. So if we go back and we think about our plot through time, that's the basis of what you're seeing here. We've got a long period in which time um, uh, time passes and the morphology of these organisms within the population along the lineage changes. And this is our period of anagenesis, a lineage changing and evolving through time, but not splitting. But then at 37 million years, Based on objective criteria, we can actually see that split into two different species. That's a cladogenic event, and that is sympatric speciation happening in the fossil record. So it's a really, really nice example. And that takes me to the end of my videos for Evolution 201. I really hope you found it interesting, and I look forward to seeing you in some other videos or in our in-person session associated with this video. I will see you soon. Take care.